Okay, our goal here is to develop the stiffness matrix that goes along with the inclined truss member, which is not nearly as simple as where we came up with this one that was aligned with the global coordinate system. The answer is going to be all the way back here on page 16. This is the form of what this answer is, but to get there is quite a lot of work. So we're going to illustrate this for one uh, case and then show you the results of the other three cases. Pull them all together with superposition and show you then the final answer. And then we'll talk a little bit about that. All right, so along the way, we we now are going to have to drop into a world where we got to be very careful about all of our notation and being exceptionally careful um, every last little piece. So our global coordinate system, capital X, capital Y, is going to be set up in the normal fashion. Our member is inclined here. Now, we're going to call the end that's in the lower left end I. And we'll call the other one end J, not surprisingly. Right? And uh, it will have, in general, in its little local coordinate system, a set of forces. Fi and Fj. Now all of that will be inclined at some angle. Now the reason why the lower left was in the um, well, well, I was the lower left, is so that we could maintain right-hand coordinate system that the angle of inclination phi of the member is from the global coordinate system over to the local. Right? That's our phi. And so that means that if we have coordinates for point i and point j, let's call them xi and yi and xj and yj. So you thought I put the global coordinate system right here at the origin of the member, but I'm not. That's the global coordinate system associated with the local, but I know that's going to even get more confusing. But the simple thing here is that, hey, you know, the sine of phi is going to be equal to the, ri the rise over run, right? And so if this is our member length L, the rise would be given to us by yj, the vertical at the far end, minus yi, the vertical distance or coordinate over here, divided by L. Right? And likewise, cosine of phi would be adjacent, the difference here over the L, so xj at the end minus xi at the beginning, divided by L. Right? And of course, L is going to be the sum of the squares of the differences between those, those two. Right? So that's the beginnings of the, the setup here. Now, we'll go through more of this as we go along, but ultimately here, di is the amount of the displacement, not deformation, but the displacement at end i. And of course, dj is the amount of displacement at the far end. And so our forces that would go along with this now would be, I, I switched notation here on you temporarily. Fi and the Fj here are the axial forces, and of course the difference here. You now these two got to be equal and opposite, of course, uh, in order for equilibrium to, to be there. And the displacement that develops is the net that is you know equal to k times delta, where a little delta is the deformation of that that member. Right? Again, our goal is to figure out what this relationship would look like, but in the global coordinate system. This is in the local, but we want it in the global. That's where we're going to head off. And we're going to do four different cases. One where we're going to move one end, one displacement. We've got four different displacements, right? we got one in the x, one in the global y down here at end i, and then likewise one each at the other, so a total of four. So we're going to do this one at a time. And so that's what's going to, we're going to go through in detail the one for the dix case, and then we got results for the DIY. We got results for the X at the other end, 
and we've got results for the vertical at the other end. All right, so we'll go through one of these in grand detail and work out everything else from there. Okay, so let's go. We've got here the case of dix. That means the displacement at end i has moved over right there. And to go along with that, there's no displacements at the other end and no displacement in the vertical here. So we're going to have then the global coordinate system, a force at end i in the y, force at end i in the x, and likewise at the j end we'll have an fj x, which is going to be equal to the opposite of fix, and we'll have fjy, which will be equal and opposite to iy. Okay, note again, we set these up in terms of the global coordinate system in the positive direction. And one of the things we got to keep in mind here is our general relationship that axial force and axial displacement is got the relationship of F equals K delta, where K is equal to EA over L. Keep that in mind as we are going through each of these pieces. All right? Now, what we want to do here is we want to start working with, well, what's the axial forces at each end? All right? So we won't take account that things have actually displaced and moved around a little bit so the angles are a little bit different. We're just going to keep these the same, but for instance down here FJ, we look at all this kind of stuff here. Here's the, the FJ. Somehow it could be equal to some K times the axial deformation of the system, right? And FJX is going to be equal to then, well there's our angle phi again, so that would be equal to cosine phi of fj. Likewise down here then this would be uh, cosine phi times fi down at that end. Right? And so on and so forth. fi y, right? there's your phi again just to get you set with the angles. That uh, fi y then would be sine of phi times fi. And since we're doing this, let's complete it all the way out. That that would be equal to sine of phi times fj. I haven't substituted in all those little uh, pieces yet. Just let, leaving that alone there for a second. All right, now, so that means what we want to do is we want to figure out then what fi is equal to. Well, it's equal to some k times a delta. And the displacement here, since the axial elongation and shortening is going to be, uh, or axial displacement at the j end is zero, and we only have it here down at the left end, then this is going to be a k times the axial displacement, local coordinate system, over here at i. And so what that means we need to do is we need to figure out how much this has shortened up. There's your little di in terms of our dix that we imposed. Okay? And that di is equal, that little di that is, is equal to cosine phi times the big one. Now sometimes people get really confused about where the angle is in this little tiny triangle. We can infer it that it must be this one right here, right? This little, oh, okay, so actually we don't have to infer it. That's what we were setting up. That That's what's going on in here. Oh, that little guy in there. All right now, uh, what I, where I was really headed was to say, hey, if this thing was inclined, or not inclined at all, it was zero, phi was zero, cosine of zero would be one, and this uh, axial displacement would be exactly equal to this global displacement. That's how we know that we actually got it quite, that we did get it uh, correct. Okay, so with that then, we find out, we can substitute in if if we now know that di is equal to that, then we can put into here. And so, for instance, this becomes sine of phi times cosine of phi 
um, times dix, and of course we've got to get the stiffness coefficient in there also. Likewise over here, then fix, we're going to have a cosine times k times this cosine, so we'll have k cosine squared times dix. Notice a really important thing here, the sines and the cosines end up in here twice meaning this isn't just only cosine, it's because we're converting a displacement over into uh, from a global back into the local and then we got the local thing we're going to take that and then get a force that's inclined and got to take that back out to the uh, global system and that's why you always are going to have this mix of either sine times cosine or cosine squared and then um, in other situations we'll get sine squared for instance in case we're basically done, right, because we got these two are just the opposites. When you get down to this one, note that that final answer is going to once again have sine cosine. That's sort of always the off term, right? When you're looking at the x component of the force associated with a y displacement, you get the mix. When you're talking about the y term, then you're either going to get the y with the y excuse me, the y with the y will always end up with a, a squared thing. And if you're being consistent with how we're working this, that'll be a sine squared. The x ones will be a cosine squared. Right? So you do that for these other two, for case 3, do it for case 4. You'll see these all worked out in the text also. And then the final general thing is, well, sum all of these. Okay? So superposition, sum all four cases. And there's your, your little k, ea over l. And for shorthand, because it gets really tedious to write out all these things, you've got that we'll let c equal cosine of phi and s equal sine of phi, just a nice little shorthand uh, work. You're going to see all of this kind of stuff patterned out, ultimately to get down to an element stiffness matrix that has all of this geometry information in it. You've got the K, basic K, EA over L, axial stiffness sitting out in front. Forgot to write that in there. And you'll have then the global displacements here, D, I, X, D, I, Y, D, J, X, D, J, Y, going along with then those nodal forces that are happening at the end of the member. So FIX, FIY, FJX, and FJY. That gives us this. All right now, the superscript E is saying here that this is in the global coordinate system, but it's associated with only the element degrees of freedom. That's what that little E is standing for. Uh, other um, authors will use, still use the lowercase symbol, but when they are dealing with just the member coordinate system, they use a prime and then they go to the global, they don't, they take off the primes, or they do vice versa. It all gets very confusing. You have to sort of know what you're doing um, at the moment you're doing it, and that helps to not get too fixated on these, these overall symbols that you're seeing here. Um, I like this one uh, coming from a couple of authors. They use the lowercase k to indicate that's the element stiffness matrix. They also put the e up there, but they have put it into a global frame of reference, and that's why capital Q, capital D uh, associated with those. Otherwise, this would have been lowercase for everything. Okay. Now, there's another way to do this, um, which is using a transformation matrix, and we'll look at that next. It's a, a very clever kind of system. Um, at work, but one thing I want to emphasize to you is that the only way any of this will ever make any real sense is if you go back and painstakingly and maybe even painfully derive this your, yourself. Use what you've got. Don't try to start from scratch and do it all independently, but rather in some sense copy down every little step that you see in textbook derivation of this and making sure that you understand every little thing that they're doing along the way. The key here is that when you impose the displacement, you're imposing the displacement in the global system and projecting onto the element what that means in terms of an axial displacement. Um, oftentimes people think they're going the other way around, and so they're going to take this di and they're going to multiply by the cosine to get to the, um, to the dx 
business here. So they'll get this relationship inverted, and that's not quite the one we want. Imposing global, what does that mean on the local? Find out the forces associated with the local using our F equals K delta, and then go backwards back out to the global, which means getting the components of the force that we just found through the axial stiffness relationship. And then you sum it all up for the four cases, and voila, you have the element stiffness matrix for a truss member in uh, inclined position.